Truett Seminary is blessed to be able to hold and to host any number of lectures during the course of any given academic year. These lectures are enabled through the generosity of donors and are arranged and implemented by Truett's Lectures and Scholarship Committee, which is presently comprised of Dr. Kimlin Bender, Chair, Dr. Andrew Artiberry, Dr. Joel Gregory, and Dr. Rebecca Poe Hayes. This morning, we are both delighted and grateful to host the T.B. Maston Lecture, made possible through the T.B. Maston Foundation, whose aim is to promote the life and teachings of Jesus Christ as lived and taught by Dr. T.B. Maston, a Baptist Christian ethicist and professor who lived from 1897 to 1988. There are a number of T.B. Maston Foundation board members with us this morning, and I would like to invite them to stand, many of whom are sitting together, so that we might be able to recognize and thank them. Would you please stand, Maston board members? Thank you for your generosity and for the opportunity that is ours to host these lectures. This morning's T.B. Maston Lecture is Dr. C. Stephen Evans, University Professor of Philosophy and Humanities here at Baylor University. Dr. Evans also directs the Baylor Center for Christian Philosophy and serves as a distinguished senior fellow in the Institute for Studies of Religion. Dr. Evans also holds appointments as professorial fellow at the University of St. Andrews and at Australian Catholic University. Dr. Evans received his bachelor's degree from Wheaton College and his PhD from Yale University in philosophy. Dr. Evans's many books include Why Christianity Still Makes Sense, God and Moral Obligation, Natural Signs and Knowledge of God, Kierkegaard's Ethics of Love, The Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith, which I must confess is one of my favorite titles, and Passionate Reason, Making Sense of Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments. Dr. Evans has also published many academic articles and has received significant grants and fellowships. Prior to coming to Baylor, Dr. Evans taught at Wheaton College, St. Olaf College, and Calvin College. Dr. Evans is a past president of the Society of Christian Philosophers, as well as the Soren Kierkegaard Society. Dr. Evans is married to Dr. Jan Evans, and together they have three adult children. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Evans as T.B. Maston Foundation Lecturer this year? So following a hymn by, at, led by Adam Doverly, Dr. Evans will come to present this year's T.B. Maston lecture entitled, Thinking Radically and Biblically About Ethics. Adam, would you come and lead? Good morning, Truett. Good morning, Truett. Please stand as we sing together. We're going to sing hymn number 499, I Surrender All. We'll do all three verses. And all to Jesus I surrender. Yeah. 
thank you to uh, Dr. Still for that kind and generous introduction. And thanks for this invitation. It's really a great honor. I, uh, I do consider Truett to be one of the jewels of Baylor. Baylor has many wonderful fine parts, but I think Truett is one of the things that makes Baylor special. I really value my relations with uh, Truett faculty. And also, I've had a number of Truett students come in and take classes, graduate seminars with me, and they've invariably been just terrific, wonderful. So I'm uh, delighted to be here to talk about how should Christians think about ethics. Now, I'm not going to talk about the content of a biblical ethic today. Uh, that's not my, my main purpose. I'm going to talk at a more fundamental level. Uh, it's an exercise in what philosophers call meta-ethics. That is, when we think about ethics, what are we thinking about and what sort of approach should we take in, in thinking about ethics? In first order, sort of normative ethics, we ask questions about what is good, what is bad, what are our moral duties, what are we forbidden from doing? We ask questions about the virtues, and those are all really important questions. But today, I'm not going to answer those first order questions, but I'm going to ask how should we approach answering them? What sort of approach should we take to get answers to them? And I'm going to argue that when facing these questions, many contemporary Christian philosophers and even some theologians have too often exhibited a failure of nerve. We have conceded too readily that ethics makes perfectly good sense in a naturalistic, secularized world. We have tended to accept the claim that secular ethicists have a plausible story to tell about ethics. Even worse than this, when we have attempted to do ethics as Christians, we have too often basically accepted as our models the stories that these secular ethicists offer. Many secular textbooks look at ethics as a kind of debate between several different types of rival alternative theories, such as Kantianism, a, th a theory of duty, utilitarianism, which says we ought to seek the greatest good for the greatest number, or virtue ethics. Uh, and Christians, uh, I think, have too often accepted that way of categorizing the feel, of carving up uh, the territory. To be sure, generally Christian thinkers will see these secular views as incomplete and in need of some modification. For example, those doing virtue ethics often begin with Aristotle. Aristotle is sort of the foundation of virtue ethics. Aristotle is viewed as giving us something like the right account of what are often called the cardinal virtues of wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance, even if he fails to see the importance of the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. Christians who favor deontological approaches, that is, approaches that emphasize duties, often begin with a secularized version of Kant. Or in some cases, they even begin with utilitarian views, views that say ethics is all about achieving results. The best con whatever achieves the best consequences is right. The popularity of this approach can even be seen in the title of uh, Steve Wilkins' InterVarsity Press book, Christian Ethics, Four Views. Uh, now, Steve is a friend of mine, and he's a good, good scholar. I'm not singling him out because he's not a good thinker. He is a good thinker. But I think in this case, even though he tries hard to sort of develop distinctively Christian versions of these rival views, the basic mistake, I think, is taking these different views as if they were mutually exclusive rivals rather than part of a richer, complex biblical story. Uh, so that's, that's a, an introduction to what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to say that Christian ethics, uh, and I'm sure uh, theologians would certainly welcome this, but I even think Christian philosophers who want to do ethics must start from the Bible. The Bible is the fundamental authority for Christian faith and practice, uh, especially for Protestants. In saying that a Christian ethic must be biblical, I don't, of course, mean to say that we should base our ethical views on proof text or take one verse out of context and do everything out of that or anything like that. Rather, I mean to suggest that we need to look at the major themes, the major lines of the whole biblical story and make that story frame the way we think about our world and ourselves and our lives. <clears throat> 
Of course, I don't mean to suggest that there's nothing for Christians to learn from secular thinkers. We can learn things from Aristotle, from Plato, from Socrates, from Kant, and from, and from contemporary thinkers. But I think that the insights to be gained from such thinkers need to be integrated into a framework that is thoroughly biblical. So when we think radically, when we think about going for the roots, we need to think, what is a biblical perspective? So what, what would such a biblical ethic look like? The first thing to be said, I think, is that a biblical ethic would not be a reductive or monolithic ethic, as many contemporary secular ethical theories are. If you look at standard introduction to ethics textbooks, they usually begin by contrasting these different theories that are presented as mutually exclusive rivals. A common schema sees consequentialist theories such as utilitarianism, deontological theories such as Kant, Kantianism, and virtue ethics as competitors and as the major alternatives on offer. Each of these approaches seeks to squeeze all of ethics into one mode or even tries to ground the whole of ethics in one principle. The utilitarian says we must seek the greatest good for the greatest number, and that's the basis of the whole uh, enterprise. The Kantian grounds all of morality in what Kant called the categorical imperative, which is supposed to be known by pure reason, by a single principle. Virtue ethicists often argue that we can do everything by just thinking about the virtues, that we can get rid of consequences and, and deontology and not think about duties or obligations, just think about virtues. But I think it's clear that a biblical ethic will not be a reductive theory of this sort. It will have to make a place for three elements, all of which are, an impor are important. One, an account of the good. Two, an account of duties or obligations. And three, an account of the virtues. I think this is not difficult to see if one pays attention to the biblical drama as a whole. So let's begin with the good. The biblical world is a world charged with objective value. In the creation narrative, God repeatedly affirms the goodness of his creation. At least five times in Genesis uh, 1, God reflects on his handiwork and we are told that God saw that it was good. And at the conclusion, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, Genesis 1.32. It's important to see that God does not decide that his creation is good. The creation is good because God made it good. There is no hint of an arbitrary act of will that brings value into existence. Value is objective, part of the creation order. This view of value as an objective feature of God's world permeates the rest of scripture as well. This is so pervasively true that it's sometimes hard to notice just because of its ubiquity. The children of Israel are promised a land flowing with milk and honey, and this promise is attractive because they are characteristics of a good land. Nor are good and bad simply features of the natural world. Social and cultural worlds can also be good and bad. Egypt becomes a bad place for the Israelites because there they are forced to make bricks without straw, laboring under oppression that does not allow for human flourishing. Proverbs provides practical advice about the practices that make for the good life, the flourishing life. The promises of God offered to the Israelites in the Old Testament are always promises of good. If we quickly move to the end of the Bible, there is in Revelation a vision of a new heaven and a new earth, a kingdom where suffering and misery have ended, replaced by joy. A framework of objective value permeates and undergirds the entire biblical narrative. What this means is that the biblical world is not the world of some enlightenment philosophers. For example, David Hume. Hume famously said, that facts are and values have nothing to do with each other. You can't go from one to the other. Hume, as a secular thinker of the Enlightenment, could find no place in the world for value except through the subjective valuing of human beings. We introduce value into the world by what we value. Values come solely from us. But in the biblical world, value comes from God, and its goodness reflects God's goodness. God himself is essentially and necessarily good. Indeed, according to a long tradition, going back at least to St. Augustine, goodness is in some way part of God. Or if one accepts a doctrine of divine simplicity, goodness just is God. God and the good are somehow one in a way that perhaps we can't fully understand. 
To see the world as devoid of value then is a consequence of failing to see it as God's creation. And I think secular ethics often uh, have that problem. Second section, the law. Value is far from being the whole story, however. It's true that once value is present, we have what we might call normativity. People who understand what is good have reasons to act in some ways rather than others. If you have a good, nice, crisp, ripe apple, it's good to eat it. Not so good if it's rotten and <laughs> you know, looks terrible, uh, right? So as soon as we have the good, we have reasons to act in certain ways and, not, and reasons not to act in other ways. Now, consequentialists or utilitarians try to derive the whole of ethics from this. And even the natural law tradition, which has been very prominent in uh, Roman Catholic Christianity, uh, correctly affirms that we have reason to seek what is good and avoid what is bad, and they try and make that sort of the basis of all of ethics. But I think there is another kind of normativity deeply embedded in scriptures, and it has a different source. The Bible sees humans as creatures with duties or obligations, and it does not see duties as something that are directly derived from value. The fact that an action is one that leads to the good gives one a reason to perform the action, but it doesn't necessarily make the action a duty or an obligation, because there are many good actions that are not duties or obligations. Duty, I think, in scripture is grounded more directly in God, in God's authority as the rightful ruler of his creation. The correlative notions of divine law and divine commands are as fundamental to scripture as is the concept of the good. God puts his new human creatures in Eden, a good place to be enjoyed, but then he issues them a command. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. God is not just the creator of value, but a sovereign who possesses and exercises authority over his creatures, including judging those who rebel against that authority, as we have done. Throughout the whole Old Testament, God's law plays a fundamental role. God's law which derives from God's commands. So much so that the Hebrew scriptures simply become known as the Torah, the law. God makes a covenant with Noah, but as part of that covenant, he gives commands to Noah and his descendants. Through Moses, God delivers the Decalogue to Israel and provides them with many other detailed lists of commandments. The commandments are regularly linked to promises of blessing to those who obey them and warnings of suffering for those who do not. Now, I sometimes hear that this talk of the law is an Old Testament theme. And the New Testament is supposedly something that focuses on love and not on law. But I think that's an oversimplified picture of the relationship between the Old Testament and the New. No one who actually pays attention to the content of the New Testament should say something like that. Jesus affirms the validity of the law in uncompromising terms. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5. We are told forthrightly that anyone who breaks God's commandments is least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus and his apostles with divine authority, in fact, pronounce new commandments. And Jesus affirms repeatedly that anyone who loves him will keep his commandments, John 14. And even that this is how one shows one's love for Christ. So what is the relationship between God's law and the good, between duties and value? I've already claimed that we cannot derive duty simply by thinking about how the good is to be maximized or realized. That's the mistake of the utilitarian. In fact, one of the functions of an obligation is to relieve us from calculations about consequences. If I know that God has commanded me not to commit adultery, I don't have to wonder about whether or not in some weird circumstance I might achieve some great good by committing an act of adultery. That kind of action has been taken off the table. I must not commit adultery, not just because the results are likely to be bad, even though that's true, but because God has communicated to me that he wills for me not to do this. I thereby acquire a new kind of reason for avoiding adultery, one that should be decisive for me and that requires no deliberation about consequences. However, although our duties are grounded in God's law, 
and not in our deliberations about consequences, there is an important connection between the good and our duties. Uh, first of all, as I'll explain later, our duty to obey God itself is grounded in facts about the good. Why should a person obey God? I think there are lots of reasons, but all of them connect in some way to truths about the good. For example, we should obey God because he is our maker. A person who creates something rightly owns what he makes and thus is entitled to do what he or she wishes to do with that creation. I think God is our owner. He's our maker, thus has the right to do what he wishes with his creation. The second reason we should obey God is that God himself is good and he has graciously given us every good we have. It is right and proper to be grateful to anyone who gives a marvelous gift and gratitude expresses itself as a desire to please the benefactor. But we can only please God by seeking to do his will. A third reason is that friendship with God is itself a great good, the greatest good a human can possess and the good that we were ultimately made to have. But we cannot be God's friends if we are radically different from God, if we don't in some way love God's character and if we are indifferent to God's will, God's desires for us. I think these truths that hold antecedently to God's commands help us see that God's commands are in no way arbitrary. This is a criticism that's often made against divine command views of ethics. Uh, philosophers call, uh, call the problem of arbitrariness here, they call it the Euthyphro problem. It goes back to a, a dialogue of Plato. I'm not gonna try to explain all that right now. But the basic idea behind the criticism is that if we try to ground uh, God's uh, if we try and ground our duties in God's commands, then duties become arbitrary because anything God commands, if God commanded us to rape or hate our neighbors or do terrible things, then that would be morally right. And that seems like a crazy uh, ethical view. But that's not something that a Christian who believes uh, that God's commands uh, are the basis of our duties would have to say or should say because God himself is good and his commands are always oriented and directed towards the good. They're not arbitrary in the least. Uh, and so I think that criticism that's commonly made just uh, uh, doesn't work. In fact, it's the fact that God's, God cares about the good and about our good that means that God's law is not something to regret or, or uh, resent or see as burdensome an infringement on my freedom. We Americans are pretty good at chafing when we think anybody is stepping on our freedom, our, uh, you know, and, and laws seem sometimes to do that. But if we look at the Bible, that's not the view that the ancient Israelites had of God's law. If we look at Psalm 119, we see that they saw God's law not as a burdensome infringement on their individual freedom, but as a gracious gift to help them flourish and live well. The psalmist affirms that he, quote, walks about in freedom because he has God's precepts. He delights in God's commands, he loves them. God gives us the law because God knows what's good for us and he desires our good. So a radically biblical Christian ethic should seek to recover this sense of God's law as a gracious gift, something that doesn't limit human freedom but helps make possible a freedom that's meaningful and genuine. To say that God's law is aimed at our good doesn't mean that God is a utilitarian or that every command must be understandable as making possible results in some immediate way that are good. After all, our highest good is friendship with God. And so it's understandable and appropriate that God might even ask us to do certain things as a test of our devotion to him and as a vehicle for our expressing of our love and devotion. The ancient Israelites were thus asked to circumcise their male children as a sign of their commitment to the Lord. But even in these cases, I think, God is always aiming at our good. There has been in the last few decades a massive shift among Christian ethicists, and this includes theologians, towards an ethic of virtue. And I'm about to talk about the virtues. I'm entirely supportive of this shift in the sense that we, do, we did need to recover uh, the virtues as an important part of Christian ethics. But before leaving the subject of divine law and divine commands, I want to emphasize that to me, it's inconceivable that there could be a biblical ethic that gives no important role to divine law and divine commands, since these play such a prominent role in scripture. 
It's thus a great mistake to think of a virtue ethic and a, an ethic of duty as rivals, uh, or to think that one could replace the other. So now, now let me turn to the virtues. What about the virtues? I think it's equally clear that virtues, under, which I understand as sort of inner dispositions to forms of life that, that, shape, that, that give shape to a person's character, virtues also play a fundamental role in scripture. From beginning to end, the scriptures are concerned with the heart, the inner character of the humans with whom God has dealings. God does not demand merely outward compliance with uh, directives, a kind of behavioral conformity with his law. He wants right behavior that is the outcome of the right kinds of desires and loves and fears. It's all about not just acting in the right way, but having the right emotions, loving the right things, fearing the right things, hoping for the right things. Of course, the virtues God desires to see in his human creatures are not quite the same as those extolled by Aristotle and the pagan philosophers. There is overlap, to be sure. Aristotle and the scriptures both talk about the importance of justice, for example. But justice in the Bible includes a special concern for the poor and the oppressed that you will never find in Aristotle. It's just not there. The Bible couples this demand for justice with the need for humility, another virtue totally lacking in Aristotle. So biblically, we are to, quote, love justice and walk humbly with our God. What's distinctive about a virtue ethics that is genuinely Christian is that God himself is the exemplar of some of the good qualities we humans are to seek to develop. God's people in the Old Testament are constantly enjoined to be holy because God is holy. Holiness in part means to be set apart or consecrated for God's service, but I think it also includes the idea of resembling and imitating God, who in the end is the only one who is truly holy. A clear example of the need to be like God is found in Matthew 5, where Jesus teaches we are to love our enemies and thereby resemble God, who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Of course, not all the virtues we are to, to exhibit are ways in which we resemble God. Some are excellences we must have to make progress towards acquiring those virtues that allow us to resemble God. We resemble God in loving, but we acquire the ability to love as God loves through faith and hope. Love, faith, and hope are thus the central virtues for the Christian. And I think that these are not just sort of topping off virtues as if the pagan virtues are okay, but on my view, once we have these Christian virtues in place, all the virtues are transformed. They are made different. They are new in Christ. Uh, and of course, the giving of the Spirit makes it possible for God's children to develop and exhibit those virtues that are described as the fruits of the Spirit. Besides love, these of course include joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, there is some overlap, at least nominally, with pagan lists of the virtues, as in the case of self-control. However, the ends for which the believer exercises self-control are again going to be different. There are also, of course, lists of vices to be avoided, notably including such traits as selfish ambition, jealousy, envy. It's clear then that a scriptural ethic must give an important place to the virtues. God is not merely a ruler giving us commands about how to act. He is in the business of personal transformation. He does not merely set some standard and demand that we measure up, but he interacts with us to transform us. He acts for us and in us to make it possible for us to become the kinds of people he wants us to become. God wants us to become his friends, to share in his eternal kingdom, but he knows we can neither achieve this nor would we even want to become his friends unless we have God's grace acting on us. How are the virtues related to the other two elements of biblical ethics? How are the, the good, the law, and the virtues related? With respect to the good, the Christian virtues give us the right priorities. The, the ability to discern what forms of goodness are most important. While natural pleasures may be permissible and good, such goods cannot take priority over the goods of character that God wants us to realize. Self-denial and suffering, then, can and do lead to deeper forms of happiness and well-being, 
when they are the means whereby we become more deeply united with Christ and Christ's body. When someone begins to resemble Christ, the scriptures tell us they can even rejoice in being persecuted, for they understand that a servant is not greater than the servant's master. The Christian virtues then give us the scale whereby we can recognize which goods are of eternal significance and which are merely of temporal importance. The Christian virtues have a complex relation with the law. Here I follow a view traditional among many Reformed Christians that there are three uses of the law, three ways the law benefits us. But all of these uses connect the law to the virtues. First of all, the virtues provide what we might call the goal, the telos, or the end of the law. The virtues give us a clear picture of the standard God wants us to reach. God's laws are not ends in themselves. It's not keeping a rule for the sake of keeping a rule. We are, they are given to us to make possible our transformation. They point at those characteristics we must have to become friends of God. And if we followed God's laws, we would in fact make progress towards such a transformation. To be sure, in our sinfulness, we do not and cannot achieve this standard. So a second function of the law is to help us see how unlike God we are, how we must change to become God's friends. We are far from fully possessing these virtues God wants us to have. So as St. Paul says, here the law functions as a schoolmaster. With its help, we can come to recognize our sinful character, our need for grace, our need for forgiveness, our need for redemption. However, I want to say the value of the law for the Christian life doesn't stop with this second schoolmaster function. When the believer receives God's grace and is born again, literally infused with new life through God's spirit, he or she begins to be able to live in a way that's pleasing to God. Out of gratitude, the believer wants to obey God and follow God's will. God's law will for such a person then provide guidance for how to live in this way. The believer tries to follow God's will not because the believer is trying to earn merit or favor with God, but rather the believer is gratefully expressing the love God has already given and which has been received freely. In my judgment, Protestants have sometimes, out of worry about works righteousness, neglected or underemphasized this third use of God's law. But when sanctif sanctification is taken seriously and emphasized as it should, and when the Christian virtues are taking hold in a person's life, God's law will no longer be experienced as a threatening burden, but once more, as in the Old Testament, a gracious gift that structures and guides our lives. Genuine progress in virtue becomes possible. So I've argued that a Christian ethic must include a theory of the good or an account of value, an account of duty that sees duty as God's law grounded in God's commands, and the account of the virtues God knows his creatures must to possess to become his friends. I think all of these are central, they are closely related, but I don't think any of them are reducible to the others. We need all three. Uh, None of these elements uh, can do, you might say, without the other two. All are essential for a fully biblical ethic. In the time remaining for me, uh, I've, I've finished the main part of this, emphasizing these three elements. But I want to say a little bit more about the importance of divine law and divine commands. Not because this element of Christian ethics is more important than the other two. I don't think it is. Um, and not because I've written about it at some length, although I have. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say something about it because I think of the three elements of Christian ethics I've talked about, it is in the gravest danger of being ignored or underappreciated. And I'll attempt to say something about the consequences, of what happens when we don't pay enough attention to God's commands and God's law. I think it's fair to say that divine commands account of moral obligations are not popular. They're even not popular among Christian philosophers and uh, theologians, at least some, the, there's, it's a mix. There are, of course, defenders of this view. But why is it the case that these aren't popular? One reason is, the reason I already gave, divine command accounts have often been confused with what I would call theological voluntarism, which sees all moral properties as settled by some sort of arbitrary act of will on God's part. 
Radical voluntarism would, I think, undermine Christian ethics. But on the account I provided, God's commands are in no way arbitrary. They stem from his character and they reflect the character of the universe that God chose to create. Uh, so I think that's uh, really important. Many people think, well, we've got, to, we've got to think about God's will because God surely has some choice about what he commands. Uh, well, does God have any choice in his commands? In one sense, he surely does in that God has a choice about whether to create any world, and if he decides to create a world, he has a choice about what kind of world to create. And surely his commands will fit whatever world he decides to create. So God could in a way give us different commands by creating a different world. I suppose, for example, if we were all immortal angels and not mortal beings, he wouldn't even to give us the command, thou shalt not kill, because nobody could kill. <laughs> we would be immortal and deathless. So in one sense, God surely has some discretion. He has some choice. But I think emphasizing the idea of discretion, uh, which makes divine command seem this sort of voluntaristic view, can be very misleading because it really, you might say, blinds us to what's really important. What's really important is not whether God has some choice about what he commands or not. What's really important is that God has given us a command. <laughs> and our relationship to God is going to be shaped by that. And that would be true even if, let's say, and I'm not saying this is true, but suppose it is the case that once God has decided what kind of world to make, suppose he thereby already has fixed his commands. Suppose his commands are just fixed by the nature of the world God decides to make. I think that's an open question whether that could be the case. But some, some Christian philosophers and theologians have thought that this was true. Suppose it is true, even if it is true, it's still going to be true that an act that God commands is not just an act that is bad. Surely, if uh, I mean, it's bad to do if God forbids it, and it's good to do if God commands us to do it. Though That would be the case because God is aiming at the good, right? But nevertheless, um, if, he, if he gives us this command, then the, the act which would have been good or bad already, because that's the reason God would have commanded it, becomes good or bad in a new way. Because now, if we violate God's command, uh, something really bad happens, namely, we distance ourselves from God and from a relationship with God. It's bad in an entirely different way. So that would be one of the consequences of failing to see God's law as fundamental to duties. Uh, the second thing that I think is really important, uh, and, and I, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more said about this because it seems to me such an obvious point, but if we don't think of our moral obligations as divine laws, then why is it that God has the, the right to forgive sins? Why is it that all of our moral misdeeds are viewed as sinful, as offenses against God, and why is it that God has the right to forgive sins? And I think the answer is he can forgive sins because every time we violate his law, we are sinning against God. So uh, we may sin against our neighbors uh, and we may need to ask their forgiveness, but it's always appropriate to ask God's forgiveness because every sin is a sin against God. And I think only a divine command account of moral obligations can make sense of that. The other thing that we need a divine command account of moral obligations for is this. The biblical view is that we are all accountable to God. We're accountable. Hebrews says God is the one to whom we must give an account. That's how God is described. But how can we be accountable to God unless we are accountable for something? <laughs> and surely what we are accountable for is keeping God's law or trying to, uh, uh, to do that. So I think that just there are many, uh, if, we, if we ignore the role of, of God's law, we will damage our theology in profound ways and damage our understanding of our own selves. So... Um, all that's just to say, uh, many, many Christians will say, yes, if God gives you a command, that's sufficient to create an obligation, but they don't see God's commands as necessary. They think that obligations are just out there, free-floating, so to speak. Uh, but on my view, uh, that's not the case. All of our uh, 
all of our, uh, all of our obligations are ultimately rooted in God's command. Even uh, as recently as the 17th century, a philosopher like John Locke found the idea of a moral law without a moral lawgiver inconceivable. This is Locke. He says, without a notion of a lawmaker, it's impossible to have a notion of a law and an obligation to observe it. Now, I think what seemed obvious to Locke doesn't seem so obvious anymore because we are the product of several centuries of modernity, a culture that Kierkegaard described as an extended mutiny against divine authority. This is a quote from Kierkegaard. There is a more or less open intent to depose God in order to install human beings in the rights of humanity? No, that's not needed. God's already given us the rights of humanity in the right of God. Kierkegaard thinks we are trying to depose God and make ourselves the author of the moral law. And you can see this very clearly in some secular thinkers. J.L. Mackey has a very famous and influential book called Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong. <laughs> That's, he's very clear about what he's doing uh, in that book. So I think we Christians should not be quick to concede that morality makes fully good sense uh, without this biblical uh, framework as a foundation. I don't mean to suggest that non-believers can't know their moral obligations and have some understanding of morality. I think the biblical view is that conscience is a God-given faculty and that even those who reject God or think that there is no God still can have some knowledge uh, written on the heart of, of God's laws. So I think we can often know God's laws without knowing that they are God's laws, and I think some secular people are in that situation. But I think that when we try to understand uh, our moral obligations, we should not be too quick to concede that we can make sense of these or understand them apart from seeing God as their foundation. Actually, you can, you can pray for me. Next week, <laughs> I'm going to Princeton uh, to participate in a Veritas forum, uh, and we're going to talk about God and the moral law. And my conversation partner is an atheist, <laughs> the chair of the Princeton Philosophy Department. I'm terrified, <laughs> but uh, hopefully uh, I will have God's presence with me there. But anyway, uh, so um, I guess I will just say, I'll conclude uh, that we need all three uh, of these elements, the good, the law, and the virtues. Um, and I think that we ought to be willing to think and live as biblical Christians, holding firmly to the necessity of all of these and seeing all of them as linked in and grounded to this biblical framework that I've tried in this brief amount of time to sketch. So uh, the part of Christian ethics that I think is under most pressure today is this divine command accounts of duties. And I think that's the part then that we have to think most about right now and focus on. Radical biblical thinking about ethics will always be much more than an ethic of divine commands, but I don't think it can be less than this. So thank you very much. Let's thank Dr. Evans one more time, please. And we'll be dismissed with this prayer. Almighty God, as we leave from this place, may we reflect your goodness in the good world in which you have made. May we take up upon ourselves the law of Christ as we serve others. And may your Holy Spirit shape us to have the character and to the traits and the gifts and the fruit that we should have as followers of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in your name, amen.